Shalom. And welcome to the Lighthouse Project and uh, the nightly co-sponsors. Yes, I guess so. Well, okay. And tonight's uh, co-sponsors. Uh, anonymous, in honor of Avram Chaim Bembela and Ariana Bat Hayeled, Claudia, Cloud, for their full shlema of Daniel Bat Mazal, Hatzlocha for Mayor Ben Sobhia and Yosef Ben Daniel, Shidduch for Amram Ben Daniela, uh, in merit of my kids, Hodaya Bat and Mayor Ben Dina, also in thanks to Hashem for everything He does for me. My family and Am Yisrael every second. May we merit the arrival of the Mashiach quickly. Gai Mordechai for the Rufu Shlema of Yosef, Ophir ben Margalit, Dina bat Zohara, Yona ben Asnat, and my newborn baby girl, Ava Zahara bat Fechala. Okay, nightly sponsors. Gai Mordechai for the Refuah Shlema of Dina Bat Zohara and Yona Ben Asnat. Anonymous for the Refuah Shlema of Yitzchak Ben Leah Malka. Anonymous in honor of the happiness, health, and wealth of Daniel Shalom Ben Zohara. And for the Refuah Shlema of Nachamendel Ben Zohara Bat Yen, for Refuah Bat Rezel. Okay, nightly co-sponsors, Tzvi Menachem Ben Chaim Yaakov. To thank Hashem for always keeping me safe and healthy and for helping me avoid what could have been a tragic accident last night. May Hashem always protect me, my wife and kids as well, as all my family members and all my fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. And that was the sponsorship. Shalom. Okay, so let's deal with it. So first of all, as always, everyone out there, please take a moment to like, share, share, like, to help spread Torah teaching. Also, uh, I mentioned quite often, Anyone uh, who would like to have the uh, notes, I email out the notes. Just go ahead and put a comment on, uh, on this, um, this broadcast, and I will go ahead and add your email onto the uh, email list that I have, and I will post it to you in a comment done. You'll know that you're getting it. Okay, so with all that said, let me just try to center this for a moment. Yes. Yes, I believe so. You gave it to me last week. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this lecture's modern day issue is to free the lonely heart once and for all. First, let us understand the gravity and the depths of modern day lonely heart. I witnessed something of just an ordinary experience in today's times, and that is what is so telling about our generation. I do not want to start up with all pet lovers, pet owners. I myself have been a pet owner. But here's the story. A woman, a mother of three beautiful children was at my home with her chihuahua. And as she was ready to leave, she turned to the dog and said to it, come baby, come to mama. <laughs> yes, I understand the deep relationship that exists between a pet and its owner. I grew up with a fish tank full of fish, which I could sit by as, I would sit by as a child and find solitude with for many hours. Nevertheless, you can't hug a fish or get nibbled by a fish. For my son, we had a baby rabbit who was all over our bed, sofas nibbling away at us, and an immense relationship of feeling was going on. So yes, I get their strong feelings. However, to refer to one's self as a pet's parent, and to refer to a pet as one's baby, drives from a lonely heart, searching from the depth, for the depths of a wholeness relationship that only a human is capable of receiving and of giving. I am not speaking of loyalty, but of a relationship but the two are not the same, especially in case of pets. Loyalty and a relationship is not one and the same. By golly, there are documented cases of pets mourning and remaining loyal to its owner post-mortem, and of sad cases of children who haven't had the time to visit their parents for years before the parent passed away. I have, ne I have even read of people who bequeath literally millions of dollars to their pets. All of this is true. Yeah. Nevertheless, I ask why these people weren't able to forge the depth of a relationship with a human in which ultimate vulnerability and therefore true oneness exists. My friends, the depth of numbing, denial, and fantasy that it takes to create a human relationship with an animal is huge, yet safe. And in the human's truth of hearts 
can never fill the emptiness. So in this late lecture, based on a mime of the Rebbe delivered in 1978, exploring the commandment of the half shekel, we will uncover the prayer of a lonely heart and its fulfillment. So, that's the modern day issue. Now let's dive into the mystical teachings. And uh, from there, we'll be able to get back to this modern day issue. So, first of all, source of prayer. The mystical source of prayer. Obviously, I'm talking about the mystical source. The legal sources we learn out from a uh, verse where it says to serve God with your heart. And our sages say, which is the service of the heart? They say this is prayer. So there's a biblical commandment of prayer, huge different opinions on what that biblical commandment is, whether it's once a day or just when needed. Um, uh, but there is a biblical commandment and it's a, a legal documentation of what it is. Go ahead, take anyone. Um, but we're talking about the mystical. What is the mystical source of prayer? So the verse says, Va'ani tefilati, and I pray. And according to Kabbalah, the word va'ani refers to the tenth emanation of the ten emanations, which is the emanation of malchut, kingship. Okay? So, where does it come to this concept? The simple explanation is, that the commandment to pray, the commandment of prayer is to ask God for your needs. On a spiritual level, there is only one need that exists. And that is the need to be one with God. For when we are one with God, all our other needs are fulfilled. So that is the ultimate prayer. If you remember, King David says, in his psalm, Acha shoaltim et Hashem, but one thing I ask of you, God, to sit in your house. Shifti beveis Hashem. To sit, may I sit in the house of God. The oneness of God. In this world, it manifests itself through Torah study, service of God. But that is the one and only prayer. So if that is the one and only prayer, why does the tenth emanation have it? And the reason is because of all the emanations, the tenth emanation, kingship, is the one that goes into the lower realm and becomes the crown of the lower realm. And thus it leaves its higher realm. We're going to talk about that more in a moment, okay? So, let's talk about this for a moment. The ten emanations in the world of divinity, at Silut, we are taught that the vessel and the lights are one, the vessels and the lights are one with him. And thus, in the ten emanations, there is no need for prayer. The way they exist in the world of divinity. However, once we have kingship, which his job, her job actually, that's the feminine mystique, the tenth emanation. Her job is to absorb all the divinity of the realm of divinity, all the divinity of the previous nine emanations, and then to draw that divine light within itself, to be able to conceal it, contract it, and then descend with the contracted ray of light, which becomes the source of creation and sustenance of the world beneath it. That's the job of Malchut. That's why Malchut is the moon. What is the job of the moon? The moon is to absorb the light of the sun. The sun shines by daytime. In the world of Kabbalah, daytime represents what? Redemption, revelation, divinity. And what does the moon do? It absorbs the light and what does it then do? It gives a reflection of that light at nighttime. What does nighttime represent? Right? Nighttime represents exile, darkness, separation, ego. Thus we say that Malchut is the moon, because that's what the moon does. It's the tenth emanation, the recipient of the higher world, and its job is to conceal that within it, descend and become the crown 
of the lower world and give forth a ray of light. So because kingship is the emanation that steps down, it descends, it separates, therefore it is the source of prayer, for it prays to return back into its oneness as it experienced it in the realm of divinity, in the world of Atzilut. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Now, I want to take this a step further. This kingship, which seems to be the tenth and the weakest and the, the one that descends, it is specifically this kingship that is connected to the supernal crown. It's the king that wears the crown, not the wise one, i.e. emanation of Chachma, not the kind one, i.e. the emanation of Chesed. None of those emanations get to wear the crown. Yes, they're all connected to the crown, but they're all connected to the external shine of the crown, which is the only emanation which is so deeply connected internally to the crown is the king, the emanation of kingship. And maybe precisely because of this, it is specifically kingship that can descend from the world of unity, the world of divinity, into the world of separation, the world of ego, the world of divisiveness. And become their source of light, to bring to them a ray of divinity which becomes their source of sustenance. Okay? So, what we're going to say here is, basically on a Kabbalistic level, the source of prayer is the va'ani sefila, I pray, and the I refers to kingship, va'ani, also in Kabbalah, the ani plays a very interesting role. On one hand it's I, play around with the letters, and you have ayin, the ultimate nihilo. Once again, the same concept of the king, the king connected to the supernal crown. And thus, the va'ani, kingship, the one that descends, it pours out its soul. And what does it pour out its soul? That it wants to return back. It has this depth of yearning to be once again in the bosom of its source, in the oneness with God. Okay? One introduction. Let's have, by the way, I just want to tell you also that in Kabbalah, we refer to the source of the Jewish people in emanations kingship is called Knesset Yisrael, the assembly of Israel. Thus, we clearly say that the commandment for the Jew to pray comes directly from its source, Knesset Yisrael, which is the tenth emanation in the world of Atzilut, Malchut of the world of divinity and oneness. Okay? Okay, let's go to another introduction, total different introduction. We'll soon connect it all. The second introduction is that this week's Torah portion is Parshat Shkalim. What is Parshat Shkalim? So just to share with you, in the times of the Holy Temple, there is a commandment in the portion of Kitisa that says that every single Jew has to give a half shekel. And when do you do this mitzvah? You do this mitzvah on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Now, in order that the Jewish people should be able to prepare and there are those that had to save and put away to put together a half shekel. So our sages instituted that we should read on one month before, which is Rosh Chodesh Adar, more specifically on the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Adar, which is called Shabbat Mevarchim Chodesh Adar, the Shabbat in which we bless and announce the upcoming Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the month of Adar. That Shabbat, we take our two Torahs. So we read the regular seven readings. Normally, we just reread the last reading, a piece of the last reading, a minimum of three verses, and that becomes maftir. Maftir means the closing out. And the person who gets that reads the half Torah. But on special days, we have a second Sefer Torah, and the maftir is not just a reread, it's a total different reading. In Parshat Shkalim, our sages instituted to remind the Jewish people that they should stop preparing in one month there's going to be the half shekel, so stop preparing. So one month before, which is the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Adar, we take out a second Sefer Torah and we read the portion called Shkalim. 
the half shekel portion. That is the Shabbat. The Shabbat is the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Adar. Thus, it's the Shabbat before, a month before Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Thus, we give the reminder. By the way, parenthetically speaking, uh, today we don't do the half shekel on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. We actually do the half shekel on the fast day of Esther, the day before Purim, uh, connected with the fact that uh, Haman, if you remember, he gave coins to the king in order to buy the Jews. So we do it before then. We go ahead and we redeem ourselves the half shekel. Uh, that's how we do it today. And it's just regular charity. In the times of the Holy Temple, however, this half shekel was used specifically to buy communal sacrifices. Why so? Because the rich cannot give more than a half shekel, the poor cannot give less than a half shekel. That means that anything bought from these coins is equally owned by every single Jew. Thus, this is the perfect place to take the communal sacrifices from because they need to be equally owned by every single Jew. Now, when you read the verse, it's very interesting how the verse says it. It says, this you shall give a half shekel of the whole holy shekel. And then it goes on to say that the whole shekel is 20 gera. Gera is a smaller coin. Question is why? If the Torah is telling us to give a half shekel, why does it have to tell us the whole shekel, how much the whole shekel is? It could have just said, this is what you should give, the half shekel, which is 10 gera. The value of 10 gera. So there's an interesting mystical teaching on this. And the mystical teaching says that there is the soul's 10 faculties. Thus the half shekel, which is 10 gera, is the metaphysically speaking, spiritually speaking, to commit and to give your 10 faculties to God. Commit them to God. Your intellects, your emotions, they should be dedicated to God and the service of God. However, in Hasidus and Kabbalah, we talk about the 10 revealed faculties, which is the way the soul, soul shines out the faculties and it permeates our conscious. That's one set of faculties. However, it then talks about a higher essential 10 faculties which in, within the soul, which is based and permeated with the transrational essence commitment to God's will. Thus we have the 20 gera, and we'll talk about why we have to mention the 20 gera if we're only giving a half a shekel. If we're only giving a half a shekel, why are we talking about the 20 gera? We're only giving 10. Why are we mentioning 10 of 20? A half of a whole. Why do we only call the whole holy? If it's a holy shekel, then a half a shekel is a holy half a shekel. Why does the sages do that? This mind is going to get back to this point. Okay? However, being that we're taught that the half shekel in the holy temple is used for sacrifices, what do our sages tell us? Today, prayer <coughs> takes the place of sacrifice. Thus, to explore the secret of the half shekel, we're going to have to explore the secret of prayer. Yeah, you're going to ask a question? Usually, I have a monologue, but to go ahead. Just a quick question. We don't give it today? We, we do give half shekels today as half dollars, but we do it on the okay, day before. Okay. Yeah, correct. And it doesn't go for sacrifices, okay? Let me just stay focused, and uh, after that, uh, I'll stay if you have any questions. And so, to anyone out there digitally connected, feel free to go ahead and send me a question, and I will answer it after the class. Okay, so there we talk about the half shekel. Now let's get into the mystical concepts that we need to be able to um, understand, explore, in order to understand this lecture. So let's go through the list. Wow. One, the lower flame calls always to the upper flame. That's a quote from Zohar. Okay? Number two, the importance of creating logically. Number three, of a compatible relationship. Number four, Adama, which means earth, or Adame, which means likened to. Number five, something humility or anything humility. Two different levels of humility. And last but not least, half of a greater whole. 
Thank you so much. How did you know? I really <laughs> needed this. Okay. So let's get into this. Thank you very much again. The lower flame calls always to the upper flame. So in prayer, we always say chapter 30 of, of uh, the book of Psalms and Mizma Shir Chanukat Labayit. And what is the verse at the end? So that I will sing praise to you and not be silent. Okay? Velo Yidoim. I will not remain silent. The Zohar goes ahead and says on this verse, the lower flame calls always to the upper flame and never stops. That's what it means. Velo Yidoim and I won't be silent. What is this lower flame? What is the upper flame? What's going on here? The lower flame refers to the emanation of kingship as she descended into the lower realm of creation. We're going to explain that in a moment. The lower flame, with Malchus, because it went down, but it also has the upper flame, the higher flame, thus the Nehuda Tatar, the lower one, is Kari Tadir. It's always calling out to the Nehuda Ilah, the higher flame, the higher light. It doesn't stop. Like the verse says, it doesn't get silent. There's just this continuous yearning and thus this continuous calling out. Okay? To understand what's going on here, we need to just understand a little bit more the process of creation. But before we talk about the process of creation, I want to share with you something. When we talk about God creating the universe, what are we talking about? We're talking about the power of ex nihilo. Our sages tell us that this is the ultimate difference between creator and creation. To create ex nihilo can only exist in the bosom of the creator. No human can create anything ex nihilo. As a matter of fact, not in my notes, but they tell this story of these great scientists with all their arrogance. They told God, we figured it out. We can go create something out of nothing. And God says, oh, okay, show me. So they go out to the beach. They start gathering together some sand. And all of a sudden they hear a supernal cough. <clears throat> Excuse me, you want to get your own sand? <laughs> Because no one can create something out of nothing. Humans can only reform. Energy can't be created nor destroyed. It can just be processed. That's a very important law of physics. So therefore, ex nihilo exists only in the omnipotence of God. Now when we talk about omnipotence, I want to quote to you a verse. And what does the verse say? It comes from King Solomon in Kohelet. Inasmuch as the king's word is the rule, and who will say to him, what are you doing? No one can question God. No one can say God has to do it this way. There is no has to when you get into omnipotence. That very notion doesn't make sense. Omnipotence has to. Can't work in one sentence. Nevertheless, most of Kabbalah and Hasidus is built upon one premise. Because the minute you get into omnipotence, you can't talk. Once someone in a discussion of Kabbalah pulls out the Hakol Yochol card, God can do anything, conversation's over. But how, when, don't you? Hakol Yochol. So the only way Kabbalah can at all talk about God and God's creation is because God made a choice. And what was the choice? God made a choice, it says in the teachings, to in as much as possible create in a logical fashion. Why so? So, parenthetically speaking, it's not in the mimer, but I think it's important to understand why the Rebbe is saying this rule. The rule is based upon a very simple understanding. God made this choice because God wants to offer us a holistic relationship with Him. Now, if God and God's process of creation thus God's relationship with us were not to be made in a fashion that the mind with its linear and circular gifts of intellect can grasp then the only relationship we would have with God would be limited to our power of obedience as expressed through our thought speech and action our mind would not be able to contemplate upon God and God's greatness, God's relationship with us, and thus there would be no relationship between the greatest gift of the human, his mind, 
and its offspring, the heart and the emotions. Thus we understand that God choosing not to use his omnipotent power to do things illogically is only so that we can have a true relationship with God. And therefore, when we now, we'll talk about this throughout the class over and over, you're going to hear this. That God has offered us the incredible gift of being as on a comparative essence with God. Otherwise, we would not be able to internalize and our relationship with God would be only very external. At best, we would be able to say Malkenu, our king, and never Avinu, our father. Even Malkenu, you're soon going to find out, we wouldn't be able to say in truth. Because there's a difference between kingship and rulership. A ruler is not a king, and a king is not a ruler. We're going to discuss this momentarily. Okay? So now you understand that God did this specifically by choice, even though there is no, he had to. God doesn't have to anything. God chooses to have to. Thus the have to is a choice. Interesting oxymoron there. But the point is that God chose to have to work logically to fit into that human mind that he was going to gift the human being with. So the human being can have a true, wholesome relationship with God. Now, the first step to making such a choice is that God now had to, by choice, had to not create directly from his essence. Because if God was to create directly from his essence, right there you would have total shutdown of the system. Number one, the essence defies any definition and parameters that the human mind can call as something. It has no definition. It has no parameters. On top of that, according to Kabbalah, kol etzem bilti mispashet, no essence will ever express itself. Remember we spoke about that? The pain of the artists who do have some type of connection with their essence vision and therefore are always disgusted by the product of their hands because essence never expresses itself. Thus it's always some pale radiance of what the essence really is all about. And if the essence could express itself, then at least the human mind would find it somewhat graspable because revelation has to express itself in form and definition. And that's the way the mind tackles anything. Divide and conquer. That's the human mind. Define borders, subdivide, 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 and thus the mind can grasp, digest, and even own. So therefore, because God wanted to work logically as a gift to the human being, to have a wholesome relationship with him, therefore God could not create directly from essence. Thus what happens is God starts creation with what we know as tzimtzum, a contraction, the one-way mirror, which has an inside essence and an outside revelation. And therefore in Genesis it says, and a river came forth from Eden and there separated into four heads of water. Now we understand what this is all about. The Eden refers to that world of divinity, the realm of inside. And then from there came forth a river, i.e. the tenth emanation kingship. And because that was only a radiance, it wasn't an essence. And it went outside, didn't remain inside. Thus, it flowed out and it separated into ego separation. And that is the universe of separation and ego as we know it. And again, Ego is not just the Musser definition of ego. The mere fact that every creation, its primary, its primary drive is survival to the point that it will kill the other to survive itself. Whether we talk about trees, plants, fish, animals, 
birds, everything. The right there is the definition of ego. Well, for our ego? Yeah, the what entire, in the entire universe. The entire universe okay. comes from that umisham yipare. A river flew out of Eden. It's outside of the essence of oneness and divinity. And then it goes on to separate. This river being Malchut. Now we understand why Malchut knows what it means to pray. By the very mere fact that it stepped out. Now here's a very interesting factor about Malchut that we have to understand. Okay? Malchut in itself steps down, becomes the ten, which is the tenth emanation within Eden, and it flows out and becomes the crown of the universe of separation, which kind of gives kingship something that nothing else has. Why? The fact that it was the tenth emanation in Eden before it flowed out, descended, and separated. Therefore, it has a connection, a somewhat compatible essence with the way it was in Eden. Thus, it can yearn for that oneness. That which is in Eden doesn't have to pray because it's not lacking. It's one with God. That which is the byproduct of kingship doesn't begin to know what it would be like. It doesn't know what it's missing. It never had that oneness. It doesn't have that compatibility of essence to the way it is within. And thus it cannot yearn for what it doesn't know or understand or taste. Therefore kingship is exactly the source of prayer. Post kingship doesn't know what it's yearning for. Remember what we spoke about with, with the one-way mirror? When you look up, you only see self. You don't see beyond that. You don't see pre-bet of Bereshit, of Genesis. So it doesn't know what it means before it flowed out. Well, on the other hand, that which is before and didn't come out, doesn't need prayer. The only one who is capable of praying and needs prayer is Malchut. It's capable because it is somewhat compatible essence of the way it was in Eden and it needs prayer because it's driven by its yearning of what it remembers okay so that's what we talk about here now we need to talk about something else here now I mentioned to you earlier that kingship and rulership are two different things. Rulership comes from the emanation of kingship, but it's completely indirect. What is the difference in kingship and rulership? Okay? So, to understand that, we need to understand the very essence of kingship. Kingship is, remember we said, it came forth from Eden, thus it is somewhat compatible existence. That's the way kingship works. Hey Vivian, how are you? That's the way it works. Why is it that the way it works? Because a human cannot be a king of anything other than its own species. Let's talk about the lion trainer. The lion trainer is not a king over its pride of lions. Even though he has complete control over them. He is a ruler over them. Why so? Because a ruler has no internal connection. The ruler only works by reward and punishment. Today with the animal rights movement, it's reward and non-reward. But the non-reward is perceived as a punishment, as anyone who has ever received the silent treatment. So therefore the reward even if it be love and affection, I don't want to use the word love between a human and an animal, I'm going to use the word affection. But when we talk about that affection, that is a reward. The animal wants that. The animal wants to be massaged, wants to be cuddled. That's a reward form for the animal. Thus the only way for a human to deal with an animal 
is only through rulership. There can be no kingship. I know Marvel has Aquaman, king of the ocean, but it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as being a king over something which is not of you. By the way, let's go back to Adam. Adam was told that he will rule over all animals, but he's not the king of the animals. The king of the animals is clearly the lion. So God told Adam that he's in charge of all animals. He's the ruler even of the lion, but he's not the king of the animals because Adam as a human cannot be a king of the animal kingdom. Thus by definition, kingship, the way it's reflected in the human race even, the way it's reflected in any species, can only be concerning that which is a somewhat compatible essence. So on one hand we have, let's talk about the Jewish definition of a king. I'm not talking about an elected president or even modern day kings. I'm talking about the Jewish expression of a king, where it clearly says, the Talmud says, that Malchus the Adam a Malchus the kingship of earth is only a reflection of the kingship of heaven. That's a very powerful word to use. And the answer is because amongst the human race there should be no notion of kingship. That's a divine thing. Right? So what is it doing amongst humans? It was given to human as a reflection of the heavenly king. But what is kingship? If you look at the first Jewish king, which was King Saul, what does the verse say? The verse in Samuel says that there was a son, his name was Saul, and then he says one physical description about him. Meshichmoi ulamailo. Meshichmoi, he was physically taller from his shoulders up. Kabbalistically speaking, that's not just a physical the description. Even till this day, when you talk about someone who is extremely exalted beyond known, you say, he is Meshichmoi ulamailo. By the way, he could be shorter than me. But he is Meshich Mun Lamaila, and I'm not. <laughs> and what that means, Meshich Mun Lamaila, literally, Kabbalistically speaking, there's intellect, there's emotions of the intellect before it develops into intellect. Thus, when you say that your head and shoulders above the other, what you're saying is that the king's intellectual emotions is superior even to the corona, the crown of the skull of every other person. Thus what we're saying is, in true Kabbalistic definition of who was chosen to be king, it is he who is on a total, total different realm of paradigm, completely with all his ten faculties. That's the definition of a king. So on one hand, the king is so exalted, not because he, he throws fear. He is, he is exalted. And yet on the other hand, there has to be somewhat capable, compatible essence between the king and who and his subjects. And thus an animal cannot be a subject of a king, of a human king. So there's rulership and there's kingship. <coughs> thus, just like we said about only Malchut, not the universe, the byproduct of Malchut. The byproduct of Malchut doesn't have it no more. Because it doesn't know what it means to be in Eden. Only Malchut, which was in Eden and then flowed out of Eden and from there separated, became a crown to the universe of separation. Only Malchut has that somewhat capable existence to what existed prior within Eden. Thus, he can have that yearning. Now, kingship itself is the only one that works like that. All other faculties doesn't work like that. You can be kind to an animal. You can contemplate the entire life existence of a cockroach. So your intellect and your emotions can connect that which is not somewhat compatible. Malchut, kingship, is the only one of the emanations which it is that existence because that's the way it exists. It is the existence of somewhat compatible to Eden, inside Eden, inside the world of Atzilut, inside the world of absolute divinity and essence. And yet it is outside, it has a descent. 
Thus it has that yearning connection. Thus it understands the depth of prayer. And I pour out my heart before you God. All I want is to be one with you again. And that's the way kingship relates to the universe. Kingship is not the king of the universe. Kingship is only the ruler of the universe. Now we're going to understand a prayer that we say every Rosh Hashanah, which is the coronation of God as our king. We don't say, God, rule upon the entire universe. Rather we say, Meloich Aleinu, be king upon us. And through us, Vakola Olam Kulo. Because without us, we'll soon talk about why the human has that power. Remember, I'll just give you a heads up. God created Adam. What did he tell the angels? Let us make mankind in our likeness and image. We're talking something here. But for a moment, put that on hold. I just want to share with you now you understand that if not for that connection, the entire universe can only ask God, be our ruler, not our king. Thus, you now understand something else. It's only when Adam was created, right there in Genesis, we're taught that he then turned to the creation and say, come let us prostrate ourselves before our king. Because without Adam, that couldn't have been possible. Because kingship only exists in that which is somewhat compatible. There is nothing in the universe of separation, which is the byproduct of Malchut, through the rear direction, which is rulership. Therefore, nothing can have the kingship relationship with God. Only a rulership relationship of God. It's only the human being that was created in the image and likeness with God. Thus can we say, Avinu Malkeinu, be our king. How can God be our king? If we can be kings over animals, and you know through science we do a lot of biology studies of the human body through the animal, so seemingly there's more in common between us and an animal than there is between God and us. So if we can be king over an animal, how can we ask God to be king over us? Thus the statement, let us make mankind in our image and likeness, and that's what the next part is going to be all about. What exactly is that concept? Why do we have the power to tell God, Meloich, be king, not just ruler? You see how everything is replaying here? Remember I told you to begin with, God did everything in the sense of, it should be logical. Thus there is a relationship, just there is a compatible existence. But we need to be more clear about that. And we need to understand that that exists only to the Adam. But it gets deeper than that. Okay? Let's go to the next step. But you follow the process here, right? That which has no compatibility can't have yearning. If there's no yearning, there's no prayer. By the way, you know, it doesn't say, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't say that the animals pray to God. It says they sing to God. A little bit of a difference. There isn't that yearning, God, make me one with you. We sing praise to our ruler. A little bit of a different concept. Okay? But let's go back to what we're talking about here now. So, to understand what it means that the human, Adam, does have somewhat of a compatibility and therefore can have a yearning and therefore can have a prayer, the only prayer which truly exists, make me one with you, God. And that answers all our prayers. Let's talk about this. So let's start. How can a human, a creature, with a beginning and an end, finite, how can the human have any compatible existence with God? The difference between infinite, beyond infinite. I mean, when you talk about God being infinite, you're not talking about Him being infinite. You're talking about to God, infinite and finite is both the same. They're both expressions of and we are finite. So it's not just that God is infinite, we are finite. God isn't even what we call infinite. We would say the infinite amount of drops in the ocean, and let's say it truly was infinite. We're talking about infinite drops of ocean. One drop is a drop of that infinite amount. We're not one piece of God's infinite. It's a total different ballpark. Infinite and finite are both a whole different world within the essence. 
Infinite and finite are both equal expressions of the essence of God. So where does a person come to tell God, well, being that I, I reflect you and I do have a connection with you, therefore, God, be our king. I yearn for you. How do we yearn for God on that level? I mean, it makes sense that we yearn for God the way a dog yearns for its master to give it a, a, a bone or to take it for a walk or the way a cat yearns for its bowl of milk. But again, that's rulership. That's not real relationship. How can we say that we are capable of having a true, wholesome relationship with God? God be our king. Our father, our king. To understand this, we need to go to the next Kabbalistic concept. Adama or Adame. So why is Adam called Adam? There's two different teachings on this word. One teaching is, the Medrash says, and God asked Adam, after he, he told Adam, name all the animals, right? It says so in the verse. God named, Adam named all the animals. After he named all the animals, God asked him, and what is your name? And he answered, because I was created from the earth, Adama, I should be called Adam. And then God went to ask, what, what should I be called? But focus just right now on what Adam said about himself. So one reason why Adam is called Adam is because he's made from the earth. However, there's another teaching quoted in the Zohar, which says, Adamele Elion, because he is likened to the supernal one. Now, seemingly, we now know the answer. When we talk about the body, the soul wasn't made from earth. When we talk about the body, we're talking about Adama, the land. Yeah, in that, in that perspective, we're like animals. And we can't have God as our king, we can have God as our ruler. But when we talk about the soul, truly a piece of God, there we say Adamel de Elyon. He is likened to the supernal one. Oh, now we understand. So it seems to be that the only way we can talk about ourselves as being somewhat compatible of God is talking about the soul, and even more so when the soul is not locked into the physical body with its descent. Once the soul comes down here, and it's starting to be haka chinik and affected by all the physical, can we really say that that's likened? Does God get headaches? <laughs> My soul does. Migraines all the time. So we're talking about Adam Elyon, the soul, the way it is up high. There it is compatible, and there it can have a yearning to go back into its mother flame. For after all, it is nothing more than a spark of its mother flame. Okay. But how do we say it about us down here? The mitzvah of prayer is down here, not up there. So to understand this, we need to understand a different question. How can we say that Adam, with his three lines, right, left, and center, three intellects, seven emotions, right, is a reflection of God? When we know that when Saul sinned, and Samuel came and ripped his cloak, and he asked us, uh, the souls, uh, King Saul asked um, Samuel, won't God not forgive me? And Saul's answer was, Ki adam hu For he is not a man that you can comfort him. Put this aside. What do you mean God can comfort Tshuva? Put that all aside. It's discussed very well in Kabbalah. <laughs> God did forgive King David. How come he didn't forgive King Saul? I mean, what happened there? That's all discussed very well in Chassidus. But I just want to focus on the first words. Ki loy adam hu, for he is not a man. And what do we learn out from that in Kabbalah? That God has no former image which we would call the supernal man. So what are you saying here? The Zohar says he's called Adam because Adam le Elyon. He is like the supernal one. That means somewhere up there, there is this notion of a supernal man. This supernal man has the form of a man, not physically and not whatever that means. And we are that tiny reflection of a reflection of what that is. But we just said King Samuel, Samuel just told King Saul, he is not a man. There is no right, left and center so you can go ahead and use the different emanations and do teshuvah. For he's not a man. So the answer is found in Zohar, explained in Chassidus and Tanya. It says, we talk about the 248 
supernal organs of the king, capital K. What is that, the Zohar explains? That is the 248 positive commandments. Then we have the 365 sinews of the king. What is that? The 365 prohibitions. And thus we say that when the human being, the human, the Adam that was given the 613 commandments, when this Adam performs and observes the 613 commandments, they draw down, they draw forth from this law Adam, he is not a man, into what Ezekiel says in the opening prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. What is the opening prophecy in the book of Ezekiel? It's the prophecy of the chariot. And what does he say over there? And upon likened to a throne, there was the image likened to a man. In other words, what does the neshama do? What does the human being do when he does the 248 commandments, thou shall, and the 365 thou shall not? He draws down from the essence of, for he is not a man, into the evolution process of being the supernal man, which has 248 supernal organs of a king, the king, and the 365 supernal sinews of the king. What did I just learn out from here? Something very important. Where does the neshama do these mitzvot? In heaven or on earth? Where did God give his Torah? On earth. So where is this process that the Adam becomes Adameh? Likened to up there or down here? Also down here. So now we know that the human being down here, the neshama, not when it's pure and up in heaven, when it's down here and it's being hacked at Chinik by my animalistic soul, my body, my ego, my drives, but I do the mitzvah, there I am likened. Because now there is the form likened to a man upon the throne. It gets deeper than this. It gets deeper than this that even the lower part of the human being, i.e. his body, is likened to the image of God. This is huge what the Rebbe is saying here. This is a huge breakthrough of the Rebbe. We find very often when we talk about the soul, the soul, the soul. The body in the world of Musr is defined as a sack of, of uh, you know, what will eventually become food for the worms. Comes along now Hasidus and says, this body that was made from earth is likened to God to the point where God is not the ruler of the body, he is king of the body, for the flesh of the body yearns for a oneness with God because it is connected with a somewhat capable essence of God. No, how does this work? So understand this, we need to go to the Medrash. The Medrash says like this, that the earth has four names, which correlates with the four seasons. Let's just go to the one we need to talk about. Adama is the correlation of the season of Tishrei. Why? It explains. Tishrei is when it rains, and therefore the ground kind of breaks into pieces of mud. Pieces of Adama. What does this mean to us here on a Kabbalistic level? What this means to us here is that the earth is made up of two elements. The Adama, the, the material of the human being, is made up of two elements, earth and water. Now let's talk about this. What does earth and water represent to us? We're saying that the human body is made up of earth and water. What does this mean Kabbalistically to us? So when we talk about earth and water, we immediately reflect upon two different realms of worlds. There is the hidden worlds, which is sea creatures. There is the revealed worlds, which is land creatures. Land creatures are the egocentric world of separation. Why? Because even though the land creatures must return to the earth for their sustenance, 
There's minerals. The minerals go into the plants. The plants go into the herbivores. Did I pronounce that right? Animals? Herbivores. Sir. Herbivores, animals. And then it digests the minerals through the plants it ate. Then comes along the carnivores and they eat the herbivores. Thus, ultimately, everything has to be traced back down to the earth. For as King Solomon says, afar, everything comes from the earth. Being that the land creatures came forth for the earth, they need to connect to their source to receive sustenance. However, unlike sea creatures, land creatures don't live in their source. Kabbalistically speaking, that means they don't live within the consciousness that they are but a radiance of their source. Thus, they have the representation of ego and separation. Unlike the sea creatures, what does the sea creature have? The sea creature lives within the water. If there's one halachic opinion concerning a mikvah, that the very body of a fish is considered water because it is so transparent and one and humble to its source, the water. Thus, we have the land creatures and the sea creatures, which is now two levels of malchut. The way malchut descends, separates, or the way malchut has within it all the lights of the world of Eden. Now you'll understand something beautiful. Why was Moses called Moses? What does the verse say? Because Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh who found him and named him. You know he had a Jewish name, by the way. Different opinions what it was. He had a Jewish name. He was found at the age of three months. Of course, his parents gave him a Brit Milan and gave him a... Well, actually, he was born circumcised, but he had a name. But the name he's known by is not his Jewish name. It's actually his Egyptian name. And what is the Egyptian name? Moshe. Why was it named Moshe? Because from the water, sea creature, I drew him forth. To take it a step further, by the way, according to some opinions, that's why he was speech impediment. Speech impediment is revelation. Moses is a sea creature. He lives within essence. With this being understood, we now understand what this means in human service. In human service to God, it's all about, remember I told you in the Tanya class, everything's about the binary code. Yesh, ayin. Ego, humility. Something, transparency. That's what everything boils down to. That which is transparent allows God to shine through, thus it is one with God. Now let's talk about the two levels of humility. There is the humility of the land, the earth, the land creatures of separation. What do they say? I am something who needs God, for without God I am nothing. But with God I am something. I am a something who needs God, but I'm not a nothing. What is the higher level, the water, the sea creature, who's not separated? What does he say? He's saying, I am not anything because God is everything and everything is God. Thus, I am not anything. That's Moses. That's the sea creature. That's the ultimate humility. Humility is not I am a mensch. There's an I, but I have to be a mensch. A mensch for a Jew is not just between man and mankind, it's also between man and God. That's the land creature. The sea creature, he doesn't start the sentence with I, because there is no I. Thy will be done. He doesn't even have to add on the words not mine. <laughs> There is no mind. There is no me. Total transparency. Now we understand what's going on here. The human being, his body is Adama. What is the Adama of the human body? The Adama we just said from that Medrash is the season of Tishrei because it's both water and land. Thus within the body of the person, the human being, exists both. The humility of something, land, the humility of anything, which is water. Thus, within the body too, the human being has the capacity, being a 
something compatible existence, once you reach a sea creature's humility, you're connected. Thus, therefore, even the body of the Jew understands the depth of the loneliness it has in being separated from God, and thus it has the prayer of nothing more. Let me be one with God. Let's close it up with the, with the go back to the half coin, and then we can close up with our modern day issue. Now we understand what's going on with the coin. The half coin that we give is the land. The half coin that God's asking us to do is, child, my child, I want you to give me, commit to me, your logical, revealed faculties of the land aspect of your being. However, that doesn't represent holy. There's still a something humility, not the anything humility. Thus Hashem tells you, I want you to know that you can only work consciously on your ten gera, which is the land ten faculties, the revealed ten faculties. I feel, I think, I understand. Well, break the I from capital to small letter I and give yourself to God's thoughts. Give yourself to God's commandments. However, you should know that when you take care of your ten revealed faculties, they are a half of a whole because within every Jew is also the sea creature part, which that is the ten gera of the holy whole coin, the whole shekel. That is the illogical, hidden faculties of the sea creature of who you are, which is based on absolute transparent commitment and oneness to God. Thus, when you give your half land creature, you should know that's only half of you. Because there's another half of you, deep within, which is the essence of your being, which truly is one with God. And thus, you can pray, because you understand through and through what it means to be one with God as a sea creature, a spiritual sea creature. And thus, you could pray, and thus you can have your prayer fulfilled. Let's close it up now with the modern day issue. Modern day issue is not so easy to talk about. It's never easy. <laughs> it's much more wonderful to get abstract and spiritual. Well, let's get practical. In our unprecedented times of abundance, we really live in unprecedented times of abundance. Okay, I'm not saying there isn't poverty, I'm not saying everyone's a walking, uh, you know, millionaire, but there's an unprecedented times of abundance that we're in. In this unprecedented times of abundance, each and every one of us far it, find it far too easy to search for wholeness in objects. Whether the object be your phone, your social media, toys, cars, clothing, food. We're all looking the easy route. The easy route is to find wholeness in objects, including pets. For right now, I want to refer to pets as, as objects in the face of the human heart. There is no a something compatible essence between an animal and the human heart. The capacity of a human heart is, is just not, animals won't have it. Therefore, we need to understand it is way too difficult and challenging the level of honesty that one must have if he or she is going to search for a wholeness with our higher power, God, and with the God that is within each one of our fellow humans. That's too hard. The amount of honesty, self-honesty I need to truly face if I want to find wholeness to truly fit, compatible, become one with the true wholeness of self, which is only through my God and through the God within my fellow Jews, 
That's way too difficult. It's so much easier to run away and find some denial form of wholeness in, oh, I'm smiling, I got a new dress. Oh, I'm smiling, I got a new car. Oh, I'm smiling, did I eat today? Or let's make it easier. I don't have to have deep conversations with my rabbit. I just open up the cage and hold a little bit of straw. And guess who's loving me to pieces? That's too easy. And it's too hard to really look for true wholeness. But on the other hand, beneath all the denial, when there's absolute silence, which we all avoid, the last thing we want is silence. If you notice, we're always having noise. Even when we're not watching TV, we have TV in the background, just to help me not have silence. But in that weird moment of silence, I know that none of this is working. The denial is not that thick. It's really paper thin. And I know that everything I've collected, from animals to, to, to treasures, it's all not real. It doesn't make me feel whole. Because the only way I can feel whole is by filling it with the other part of my wholeness. The other part of my half shekel. And that is God and the God within my fellow people. That's all there is. I didn't know if I was going to say this or not. Let me just say it. I'm going to give you an example. And I might mutter my way through it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I share with you a simple example, that of a child and a parent. How often do we see parents try to disown their children and children to disown their parents? Decades of therapy and thousands of dollars, and at best, all we have is cope-ability, but never wholeness. The child gets married and tries to fill the gap with love for their spouse and children, but the whole remains unfulfilled. The parent tries to redirect love to their other children or to this child's children, but the whole remains. The prayer of a lonely heart is to be whole once again, and the prayer will never be answered by anything but the true wholeness of your half of heart. Yes, sometimes the wholeness must remain within our own hearts of forgiveness, caring, love, but detached for the moment. However, there is no other wholeness but for embracing in whichever way is presently possible all the pieces of your own wholeness. Thank you.